This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Evacuations underway as homes burn after volcanic eruption in DRC's Goma City. Investigations in northwest China after 21 people die in extreme weather in ultramarathon events. And in Gaza, government offices are reopening after an Israeli Palestinian ceasefire deal, but health infrastructure left in ruins. Hello and thank you for joining us on Africa Live. I am Penina Karibe. Let's have a look at the stories coming up this hour. Owner of the Ever Given blames Suez Canal Authority for the grounding of the ship. In sports, the story of a boxer who has set up a center for the reintegration of children and unemployed youth. Let's begin in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where thousands of residents of the eastern city of Goma have been fleeing their homes after Mount Niragongo erupted on Saturday. Many of them crossed into Rwanda after Kigali opened the border point of Gisenyi. Authorities in Rwanda say over 3,500 have so far arrived and are being housed in local schools and places of worship. A volcanologist in Goma said new fractures were opening in the volcano, letting lava flow south toward the city after initially flowing east towards Rwanda. Molten lava set homes on fire as it slowly spread to the lakeside city of about 2 million. Local reports say the lava seems to be slowing down after reaching the city's suburbs. Some residents had tried using water to stop it before fleeing. Niragongo last erupted in 2002 and left at least 250 people dead and 150,000 displaced. It is also considered among the most dangerous volcanoes in the world. A special investigation is being carried out in northwest China into the deaths of 21 ultramarathon runners. They died as extreme weather hit the race, which covers a distance of 100 kilometers in mountainous terrain. Local authorities said the runners had to contend with hailstones, freezing rain, and gale force winds in one high altitude section. A significant temperature drop caused multiple cases of hypothermia. Another 151 runners were confirmed safe. Eight of them had minor injuries is what local authorities had to say. This was a public safety incident caused by a sudden weather change. Authorities in Gansu province have set up an investigation team to further look into the incident. As the organizers of the marathon race, we feel a deep sense of guilt and responsibility. We express our deep condolences to the victims and our deep sympathy to the bereaved families and those who were injured. Two people have been killed and eight others injured in a shooting incident in the U.S. state of Minnesota. Police in the city of Minneapolis say they found a very chaotic scene with multiple people shot laying on the ground. Initial investigations indicate two people shot at each other as they got into a bubble confrontation. One of the shooters was killed and the other has been taken into custody. Meanwhile, in Gaza, government offices are reopening following a ceasefire deal which ended 11 days of fighting between Israel and Palestinian militants. The narrow strip was left devastated by the conflict, with much of its held infrastructure in ruins. Our correspondent Noor Harazin has more. The El Rimal Health Center and the administrative building of the Gaza Health Ministry are some of the structures severely damaged by Israeli airstrikes. Authorities say some doctors and officers in the building were also injured. The Arimal Center is the only COVID-19 testing facility in Gaza. Our work stopped due to the bombings and power cuts. They've affected our equipment. This is the only lab under the Gaza Health Ministry that specializes in coronavirus testing. Now it's impossible to complete these tests, which will trigger a spread of the virus. You can see the destruction around me from the bombing. The COVID-19 situation has worsened in recent weeks, causing a major strain on the Palestinian health care system. Gaza officials have warned of a disaster due to the damages and lack of medical equipment. 
They say the matter has been worsened by evacuations during Israel's assault. Thousands of families took shelter in schools run by the United Nations. Classrooms are overcrowded, sparking concerns over a rapid rise in COVID-19 cases. I live here in one room with my children and grandchildren. The men sleep outside to lessen the crowd. We can't even get tested. I can't sleep or even breathe at night because I'm afraid we'll all get sick. As you can see, we are overcrowded here. There are 40 to 50 people per room. This does not provide any protection from disease. Health tools and protective equipment are not available. Apart from masks, gloves and basic cleaning items, medical supplies are also running low. Although Egypt has let in a few trucks with some humanitarian aid, Gaza's healthcare sector is still on edge over shortages. Nur Harazin, CGTN, Gaza. The United Nations Security Council has called on all sides in the Israel-Palestinian conflict to fully adhere to the terms of the ceasefire. The 15-member council issued a statement on Saturday, having been unable to speak during the 11-day conflict due to opposition by the United States. It stressed the immediate need for humanitarian aid for Palestinian civilians. The French mission to the United Nations said it suspended its push for a resolution on the issue. Now, amid the ceasefire between Israel and Palestine, Palestinians brokered by Egypt, many Palestinians are still in dire need of humanitarian assistance. The Egyptian government is now offering much needed supplies to the affected Palestinians. Meanwhile, President Abdel Fattah el Sisi has announced that Egypt will help in Gaza's reconstruction efforts through projects worth 500 million US dollars. Here's Egyptian Zadel Mahri with more details. The suffering of the people in Gaza during the heavy Israeli bombardment has led to lots of public sympathy for them across Egypt. That has fueled the strongest public awakening in the support of the Palestinian cause seen in years. A stream of in-kind donations crossed the border to assist the people besieged in the Gaza Strip. It is not allowed in Egypt to organize protests, even if it's in support of a foreign cause. The unions know that any request to organize protests will be rejected. Any violation of that will see the Egyptian administration arrest those involved. So the least Egyptians could do at this stage is to volunteer and show support to Palestine through donations. It is the only way they can show solidarity. The Egyptian authorities have opened the Rafah Passage, Gaza's only gateway to the world. It's allowing trucks carrying tons of supplies into the Strip. The Egyptian Red Crescent was the first to offer post-war trauma support. One of the most important services we provide is primary psychological support. Some people were harmed, others lost their loved ones, others are in critical condition. The Egyptian Red Crescent is a very strong in primary psychological support. We are also currently in contact with the Palestinian side to determine the needs of the camps or shelters for those displaced by the bombings. A ceasefire is in place, but that doesn't mean the assistance from Egypt will stop. With the cessation of hostilities, talks about reconstruction have begun. Despite Egypt's challenged economy, Egyptian President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi has vowed to build infrastructure and construction projects in Gaza worth 500 million US dollars. The magnitude of destruction Gaza witnessed in just one week by far exceeds any previous wars between the Israelis and the Palestinians. And that has created a driving force for Egyptians to show their Palestinian brothers that they can support them by any mean to at least live the suffrage they feel. Al al CGTN, Cairo. The violence in Gaza is posing a dilemma for Arab countries that recently restored ties with Israel. United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Morocco and Sudan, which all recently normalized ties with Israel, now find themselves balancing their new relationship against citizens who have been vocal in their anger at Israel's violence. Meanwhile, Egypt is seeking to restore its regional clout in this conflict. Isia Sarakim with more details. With the first major crisis in Palestine since the normalization of ties with Israel, reaction from countries like the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain have been described as comparatively muted. Unfortunately, the reaction from these countries was not up to the horrific events on the ground. It was limited to denouncing or condemning only. 
As observers, we expected these countries to take steps such as freezing the normalization process or taking tough diplomatic action. It's obvious these countries have internal problems. Sudan, for example, is going through a transitional process. Morocco, the UAE and Bahrain have their own issues, but this goes for many Arab states. Normalization doesn't bode well with the anger amongst citizens in the region against Israel's military strikes on Palestinian civilians. There is a large stream of anger in the Arab world against what uh, the Israelis are doing against the Palestinians. And it's normal that the, uh, our people everywhere are uh, angry with uh, the, the process where we give Israel some privileges without having any uh, return for this. But we have to come to a sort of national consensus. What are our next step with Israel? Uh, there are two ways, either to start or to continue uh, hatred against the Israelis or to convince the Israeli people and the Israeli leadership that peace would bring to Israel much more benefit rather than war and aggression. Meanwhile, there were questions concerning Egypt's position in the Arab world after the Arab-Israeli closeness. While some have expected that Egypt's role in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict would diminish, Cairo has actually managed to spearhead efforts that led to a ceasefire between both sides. Experts believe it's been a testing period for Cairo as well. In all the clashes between Israel and Palestinian resistance or in Gaza, Egypt was a major player. In 2014, in 2008, and during the Intifada, Egypt was a main and influential player between the sides. And the same now, in 2021, Egypt had the leading role, although Jordan and Qatar were involved as well. Although the Abraham Normalization Accords have softened the Arab stance towards Israel, it has also cemented Egypt's presence as an influential force in a changing geopolitical Middle East. Yes, Hakim, for CGTN, Cairo. Let's break up our top story at this hour. And we began in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where thousands of residents of the eastern city of Goma have been fleeing their homes after Mount Niragongo erupted on Saturday. Many of them crossed into Rwanda after Kigali opened the border point of Giseni. Authorities in Rwanda say over 3,500 have so far arrived and are being housed in local schools and places of worship. Let's now go live to the DRC. We have our correspondent, Chris Ochamringa, joining us from Kinshasa. For more on this, Chris, what is the latest on this volcanic eruption in Goma? Well, Penina, uh, Goma City is now relatively calm uh, because uh, the lava from Mount Nirangongo has stopped flowing. Uh, the officials there say there were no deaths or casualties reported, uh, and uh, they've urged the people to remain calm. But like you mentioned, many people, many residents of Goma City fled to neighboring towns and some even crossed to Rwanda. Uh, they are fearing for their lives because uh, they still have very fresh memories of what happened in 2002 when uh, the mountain, the volcano erupted, uh, killing more than uh, 200 people and it also destroyed very many houses. We've also seen some footage of... Uh, uh, roads that were dest uh, destroyed and also some houses in valleys on the outskirts of Goma that were also destroyed. Uh, the, the government, the governor of, uh, of that area, a military governor, says that uh, they are working with the, the authorities in the central government in Kinshasa to see, to come up with strategies of trying to help the local people there. Okay, okay, so Chris, you've touched a little about the damage done. So let's talk a bit more on that. You know, just paint us a picture of the kind of damage we are looking at and how those who are living near Mount Niragongo in Goma are being assisted. Well, Penny and I spoke to some people in Goma City and they told me that there were many houses that were destroyed. We don't know yet the exact extent of the damage because the government hasn't given any official uh, information. We hope that they will make that uh, announcement later today. But uh, we've just seen footage, like I mentioned earlier, of houses you know, in valleys that were burnt by the lava that flowed from Mount Nirangongo. Uh, the, the experts there say that uh, 
Goma city, which has an estimated population of 2 million people, was out of danger because the lava was flowing towards the Rwandan border. And so uh, right now we are still waiting for officials to, to give us an update. Uh, we, we also know that the Prime Minister of the DRC, Sama Lukonde, held a meeting with other cabinet ministers and they decided to come up with an evacuation plan for the people in Goma. Uh, the DRC President Felix Chisekedi, who had visited the Europe, had to cut short his visit to return to oversee this humanitarian response because uh, the, the area where this uh, volcano erupted is uh, under a state of siege. And so there's a restriction of movement uh, of, of people to different areas. But then, you know, because it was an emergency, people had to just go to run for their lives. We're waiting to hear more from the government authorities. Penina? All right, Chris, we appreciate that update. Thank you very much for joining us. Chris Chamringa live in Kinshasa. Now, some COVID-19 patients in India are suffering from a potentially deadly black fungus infection. Local media say over 7,200 cases of black fungus have been found across the country. The disease, which is called mucormycosis, has, high, has a high mortality rate, is affecting increasing numbers of India's coronavirus patients. It can cause blood or double vision, chest pain and breathing difficulties. And doctors have often been removing an eye or part of the jaw to try to stop it spreading. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi said the country had to take precaution and prepare to deal with it. Now, earlier, we talked to Dr. Alice Hyun Kyung Tan, an internist at Ms. Medi Women's Hospital in Seoul, and she explained more about the black fungus disease in India, the medical term for which is mucormycosis, and how it's linked to COVID 19. Take a listen. So mucormycosis is a very rare but very dangerous disease with a high mortality of about 50%. The range is between 40 and 80% depending on the location of infection and the underlying condition of the patient. The fungus can infect uh, any part of the body, but the face is frequently infected and it can infect the eyes, nose, and sinuses. And once it affects the soft tissue and skin, it can start to eat away and destroy the bone. And from the bone, it can start to infect the brain. Uh, it's a very difficult disease to diagnose and oftentimes patients will have progressed for several days before coming to a doctor to get the diagnosis. The relationship between mucormycosis and COVID-19 is as yet unknown. However, there are many risk factors involved. First of all, diabetes is a well-known risk factor for mucormycosis, and up to 10% of adults in India have diabetes. It's thought that many more adults have undiagnosed diabetes. Uh, COVID-19 also, as a disease, causes irregularities in the immune system. It can also cause blood sugars to get out of control. So it's really a perfect storm in terms of both the disease and the treatment of the disease, uh, they can all lead to a high risk for mucormycosis. Namibia is pushing ahead with its COVID-19 vaccination drive to meet the 60% target for herd immunity. The country's vice president, Nangolo Mbumba, says it's in a bid to lower the country's infection rate as well as reduce the number of hospitalized persons. The vice president is among the first to receive a dose of the Sinopharm jab. The vaccines are a donation from the Chinese government. Mbumba is encouraging everyone to get vaccinated to help curb the spread of the virus. It's coming up to 19 minutes into the hour. You're watching Africa Live. Let's take a short break. Coming up. Why Africa leads the world in road traffic deaths every year and what the continent can do about it. Africa is a continent of diversity with varied climates and enchanting geography and a people so distinct, but with a shared enduring spirit. We are at the heart of the continent to bring you the untold stories. Let's have a look. We celebrate Africa as it shapes its own destiny. Africa Live. Find your voice.
Nigeria is my home. 160 million vibrant, ambitious individuals constantly seeking the perfect self-expression. It is these people who inspired me to be that person that is seen, to be a voice that is heard, and ultimately to be the anchor that I am. I have to tap in, tune in, and turn on the very best qualities within me to deliver the news. I'm Richard Nta, an anchor for CGTN. New details are emerging on the death of a black motorist two years ago after being stopped by police in the southern U.S. state of Louisiana. Video from cameras won by state police showed the arrest of Ronald Green. Police initially said he died during a car crash, but the videos show he died after being bitten by officers. CGTN's Toby Muse has the details, but a warning, some may find these images disturbing. Okay, I'm sorry. More video has been released of a controversial 2019 police arrest of a motorist following a police chase in the U.S. state of Louisiana. The driver, a 49-year-old black man, would later die, casting doubt on the police version of what exactly happened. The family of Ronald Green says that initially authorities told them that he had died from injuries from a car crash after a traffic violation two years ago in the city of Monroe. A cover-up from the very beginning, from the top down. It's, it's organized crime within the state of Louisiana. The new videos come from the body cams of the four police officers, all white. They show Green being removed from his car by police and a scuffle on the ground. Green is face down while one officer is on top of him. Green is tased by another officer as they order him to put his hands behind his back. Once handcuffed, he's left face down. The AP reports that police officers are trained to roll detainees on their side or sit them up when handcuffed to ensure they are able to breathe. At one point, a police officer orders Green to lie on his stomach. Don't you turn over. All right. Don't you turn over. You lay, right. lay on your belly. Lay on your belly. Green would later die on his way to the hospital. Green's family has launched a lawsuit and called his death a murder at the hands of the police. The FBI is conducting a civil rights investigation. The released videos come days before the one-year anniversary of the death of George Floyd, whose killing at the hands of a police officer led to months of protests across the U.S. and the world. Toby Muse reporting for CGTN, Arlington, Virginia. The last seven days have seen the world observe the sixth United Nations Global Safety Week. Every year, more than 1.3 million people die in road traffic crashes and 50 million are injured. One person dies every 24 seconds because of a crash. The World Health Organization says Africa is the region with the highest number of road traffic fatalities in the world. UN agencies are urging policymakers to lower speed limits in a bid to cut traffic deaths and injuries, a campaign to get people to slow down on on the roads was launched this week. The UN says car crash injuries are the eighth leading cause of death globally for all age groups. It is also the number one leading cause of death among children and young adults between the ages of 5 and 29. The focus of this year's Global Road Safety Week is to encourage policymakers to drop speed limits to 30 kilometers an hour in cities where cyclists and pedestrians interact closely with car traffic. For more on this, we are now joined live by a World Health Organization technical officer, Binta Sako, speaking to us via Zoom from Ouagadougou. Thank you very much for your time today, Binta. So the road fatalities in Africa clearly are worrying. The World Health Organization is recommending a speed of 30 kilometers an hour in major cities. Is this practical and how will it help the situation? Thank you. Thank you for raising this issue. Indeed. Um, road fatalities are of concern in the region and WHO is recommending a reduction of the speed limits in cities where uh, pedestrian, cyclists and motor traffic are mixing. And many countries have already successfully implemented this policy and evidence shows that it does indeed reduce fatalities. That's why uh, WHO is uh, promoting this new policy, these new speed limits from the standard um, 
50 kilometers per hour to 30 because it's like I was saying, you know, it's effective um, and countries who have implemented it have seen a reduction in their fatality rates. And we know that for every kilometer increase in speed, we have about four to 5% increase in fatalities. So uh, evidence does recommend that we have this shift in reduction of speed. Okay, so most cities already have traffic clogs that make it impossible to even reach that speed. So what are the other factors causing these huge fatalities besides speed? Yeah, and speed is just one amongst other risk factors. We also have drink driving, which is a very important risk factors, risk factor increasing the risk of accidents. But we also have other behavioral uh, risk factors, uh, wearing seat belts, uh, cyclists and uh, motorcyclists having helmets, the child restraints for, for children, which may not reduce the risk of the accident, but definitely reduces the severity and the deaths that will occur when, when a crash happens. And, you know, uh, uh, apart from these behavioral risk factors, we also have risk factors that are related to the infrastructure, the road design, and also those that are related to the quality of the vehicle that are circulating in our you know, on our roads and the post-crash care. All these, uh, you know, policies and recommendations on those risk factors um, are not fully implemented in the region, which makes it more dangerous on our streets once there's a crash. There's more likely a death that occurs. Right. I, I like the fact that you've talked about the motorcyclists, for instance, especially here in Africa. That's a huge problem when it comes to just observing the basic safety measures that are needed to be on the road. So how best can nations handle those other contributors to traffic deaths like drunkenness, pedestrian mistakes and, and many others? Well, the policies, the recommendation, WHO has a set of recommendations for all the risk factors. Uh, there are standards international standards that need to be adhered to. So I think what nations need to do now is uh, implement these policies. For drink driving, we know that by reducing the acceptable level of blood alcohol uh, in drivers is a way to go. Not all countries you know, meet the best practices in all these different policies. So it's now time for nations to uh, mobilize the resources, uh, put in you know, the highest political will and implement these recommendations for all the risk factors, not only for speed, but for all the other risk factors as well. All right, Bin Tosako in Ouagadougou, many thanks for joining us. Tunisian President Kai Said has met Italian Interior Minister and the European Commissioner for Home Affairs to discuss the irregular migration issue from Tunis. Adnan Shawashi has the details of that visit. President Kai Said urged European officials to adopt a comprehensive approach to irregular migration that goes beyond security solutions and addresses the root cause of this phenomenon. The Tunisian head of state emphasized the importance of combating poverty and unemployment and promoting development policies. Unlike in the past, now we all need to look for a new way of tackling irregular migration. It's useless to treat the consequences without understanding the cause of this phenomenon. The main reasons are certainly linked to social and economic situation. Irregular migration from Tunisia was non-existent some 20 years ago, or very limited. The visa to Europe was not even required. EU Commissioner for Home Affairs noted that most irregular arrivals from Tunisia will not be eligible to stay in Europe. In fact, irregular migrants will be given a return decision. Ilva Johansson added that this agreement will destroy the business model of the smugglers. But it's equally important to also prevent irregular departures, to manage migration, the border management, to fight these organized criminal groups that are arranging and making a huge lot of money of putting people or, force or uh, convincing people to get into these boats on very dangerous journeys. We have to fight the smugglers and prevent irregular departures. Italy's interior minister announced that Tunisian authorities are willing to repatriate thousands of irregular migrants who have reached Lampedusa after departing from the Tunisian coast.
Tunisia has welcomed Italy's proposal to establish a direct hotline between our two countries to contain and block these irregular departures. Tunisian Navy units rescued Bangladeshi and African undocumented migrants this week. Meanwhile, Coast Guard units in Sfax and Mehdiya thwarted several illegal sea border crossing attempts. At least 55 illegal migrants were arrested and five fishing vessels were seized. The EU Commissioner for Home Affairs and Italian Interior Minister declared that the stability of Tunisia and the post-pandemic economic recovery are necessary for stability in Italy and the EU. Europe is committed to supporting Tunisia by contributing to development and to job creation in order to reduce irregular migration. Abdel Shawishi, CGTN, Tunis. Saturday was the International Day for Biological Diversity. In Kenya, biodiversity levels are dropping by the year as habitat loss, climate change and human activity drive species to extinction. And as CGTN's Daniel Arab Moy reports, restoring mangroves in the coastal town of Lamu has never been more important. Mangrove forests are important ecosystems that grow along Kenya's coastlines. In the country's coastal town of Lamu, they serve as habitats for fish, crabs and other marine species. Farmer Shukri, a resident of the island, has been spearheading the planting of mangroves at the coast. The more we plant mangroves, the more the fishing grounds will be many. At the same time, the erosion will stop and also the number of crabs and also the juveniles, baby turtles, they're just living next to mangroves. Here in Lamu, mangroves are also used to protect vulnerable coastal communities from the devastating impacts of climate change. This mangrove forest is naturally protecting families and reducing the risk of tsunamis and other hazards in the coastal areas of Kenya. But despite their wide-ranging benefits, mangroves are still being destroyed and degraded at an alarming rate. However, residents like Abdelhai Sultan understand the importance of the ecosystem. Mangrove is very important for the whole Lamu. Like all the houses with the Makuti's roof, you must use the mangroves. That's a very important for us. Mangrove is where the crab, they grow up, where the prawns, they grow up, where the jumbo they grow up from the mangroves. People are really polluting the environment in terms of the environmental uh, degradation. Pe uh, people are cutting down mangroves and they don't replant them. People are pouring the plastic into the sea waters. And uh, also people are doing unnecessary things with the environment. And this leads to many impacts, negative impacts. For many residents here in Lamu, Mangroves remain an important ecosystem that protects the environment. Daniel Arap Moy, CGTN, Lamu, Kenya. Over in Zambia, environmental activist Robert Chimambo has been sharing his thoughts about conservation of biodiversity for our planet. He speaks about the need to protect the planet, especially during the coronavirus pandemic. He says the pandemic is a clear indicator of consequences that could face mankind if further degradation of the environment is not combated. Coronavirus is a very good case. It is essentially our degradation of who? our biodiversity, our environment, that these zoonotic diseases, these diseases or viruses coming from animals into human beings. That is an indicator of breaking down of our environment. So it doesn't matter where you do it. If I'm destroying my environment here, chances are something from here will go around the world. So Wherever we are, whether you're in the Arctic, we're in the tropical Africa, let's look at our biodiversity because that is what will look after us. And it's demonstrated the oxygen, the, the, the plant photosynthesis, both in the sea and all. That is what keeps life. Biodiversity is the order of life on Earth. If human beings and all life forms have to survive, we have to manage our biodiversity, uh, both uh, terrestrial, marine and subsoil we need to manage that 
Africa is the nexus of enterprise and global business will tell you why it matters. From the mega investment projects to multi-billion dollar mergers and acquisitions. Africa today collects, just in terms of revenues from taxes alone, $545 billion a year. If you take 10% of that and you devote it to the energy sector, problem solved. All this on Global Business, weekdays at this time on CGTN. Africa Live. Find your voice. A group of women entrepreneurs in the Democratic Republic of Congo have set up a company that will convert agricultural material into value-added products. The aim is to create employment and contribute to the country's economic development. The company owners met with other Congolese businesswomen at a conference in the capital Kinshasa to discuss ways of helping women generate income. CGTN's Christo Chamringa has more from Kinshasa. Noda Luafa is a mother of nine who's been selling charcoal in Kinshasa for 19 years. Her husband died a year ago, leaving her the huge task of fending for her family. She has dreams of expanding her business, but lacks money to do so. In the past, my business was doing very well. I used to sell two or three sacks a day, but it's now moving very slowly. I had plans of stocking more sacks, but there's little money in circulation. I just can't afford to expand. Noda is one among millions of women who are struggling to support their families in the DRC. A group of prominent women entrepreneurs in the DRC have formed a company that will help small-scale businesswomen make more money. So we need to put them together, train them, so that we can create like big company, and this company is going to contribute to the economy, to produce jobs and all these things. They will start off with a company called Tulime Pamoja that will produce maize flour. The owners intend to help women engaged in small-scale business to move away from fighting for survival to start making profits. Up to now, we have small, small agriculture, you know, people with small, small piece of land. And this program, this project comes with let's invest together and make something big for everybody. I think this will be like the pilot that will push on other uh, people to invest also in the same model. The DRC is estimated to have 80 million hectares of arable land, but only 10% of it is currently being used. That's because conflicts in the east of the country have forced thousands of people to abandon their farms. Women doing business face several challenges in the DRC. Some of the most serious ones include limited access to finance, and disproportionate family responsibilities. The conflicts in the east of the country have made their situation worse, but the government has promised to help improve the business environment for women across the country. Chris Sachamringa, CGTN, Kinshasa, Democratic Republic of Congo. The 10th China Flower Expo has opened its doors on Shanghai's suburban Chongming Island. Around 20,000 species of flowers will dazzle visitors, including many rare and exotic varieties. Businesses are also attending as they look to rake in a profit. Cheng Tong is there. The Century Pavilion looks just like a butterfly. And it's one of the most popular spots at China's premier flower expo this year. Inside the Century Pavilion is so refreshing. All types of seeds and plants are on display. It's just like your backyard garden. The rare and exotic plants are attracting tourists in droves. I just want to take a look. The plants are rare. We aren't usually able to see plants like this. It's great. The Century Pavilion covers a total area of 12,000 square meters. In addition to the seeds on display inside, the outside garden also exhibits tropical plants rarely seen in Shanghai. People want to come to the flower expo because they want to see the flowers, smell the scents and relax. But these flowers are everywhere. So in addition to the ordinary flowers, we offer special plants that are rarely be seen here. The flower expo is far more than a flower exhibition. As of the end of 2020, China's flower plantation area has reached more than 15,000 square kilometers. 
China is now the largest flower producer in the world, and that means huge business opportunities. This year's Flower Expo also includes a flower trade fair. Producers show off their latest designs, hoping to attract more consumers and exhibition. Zhao Hai is witnessing better sales on indoor plants. Not many people knew about our products in the past, but since last year, we're seeing more and more orders, and we're now hiring new staff to expand our business. Some 400 companies from 19 provinces and cities will be showing their products until June. The organizer says Chinese consumers favor new species of flowers with strong aesthetics. In 2020, flower sales in China reached some 42 billion U.S. dollars. China's flower market has upgraded in recent years. New products have come out, and new things from overseas have also been introduced. People are accepting these high-quality products, relatively high prices. The Flower Expo has attracted high numbers of tourists since opening. Some 20,000 tourists came for the opening on Friday. The event will remain open to the public until July. Chen Tong, CGTN, Shanghai. Chinese agronomist and academician Yuan Longping, globally renowned for developing the first hybrid rice strains, died on Saturday at the age of 91. Thousands of people have visited the funeral parlor where his body is resting to pay their respect. Our reporter Sao Bing has more from Changsha. It has been a very emotional morning this morning. As you can see that thousands of people have come to this uh, Changsha Mingyangshan funeral home and to pay their condolences to our academy and Yuan Longping, uh, who has passed away at noon on Saturday at the age of 91. According to the staffs here, many people came in as early as 5 o'clock, and they kept uh, voluntarily lining up to pay their tribute and say farewell to uh, the ac academy. Yuan Longping is very famous, known for its hybrid rice. Uh, he started his studies in as early as 1970s. In a very popular ask and answer uh, social media platform, Quora, there was once a question that was very popular asking how China can feed its 1.4 billion people. And there is no doubt that uh, Yuan Longping's hybrid rice plays a very important part in that. Nowadays, his rice makes up about 60% of the total production in China. There are many young people, teenagers, and some pupils even came in with their um, chrysanthemums in hands to pay their tribute uh, to Yuan Longping. And uh, I can also find some like messages inside the flowers calling Yuan Longping grandfather Yuan and say that they will eat well and cherish food. As for those people who cannot come in person to pay their tribute, the staffs told me that they have also set a morning hall on the internet and people can send their condolences and pay their tribute on the internet. Inhabited for over 700 years, Kenya's Lamu town is considered by many as the cradle of Swahili civilization. But the World Heritage Site is now being threatened by pollution and a growing number of motorcycle taxis, locally known as Boda Bodas. CGTN's Daniel Arapmoy tells us more. In this small island town of Lamu, a historic Swahili trading outpost, motorbikes maneuver through a crush of donkeys. Lately, there has been an increase in the number of motorbikes. Residents here are not pleased about the two wheelers congesting ancient narrow lanes. Long time ago, we used it a donkey transportation, yeah, to collect all things like a material of building houses, like uh, food to supply for another town. But this border border is a big terrible. This is too much. Is everywhere. When you walk in the market everywhere, you find a motorbike somewhere. Hey, you want to go where? Where you want to go? Which is no good. Lamu, we love donkeys. We love walking. This is the best. It's no good for motorbike for Lamu. Donkeys used for centuries to ferry chunks of washed coral to build Lamu's iconic Swahili homes are slowly phasing out. Residents of this small island of Lamo fear that their delicate ecosystem, their livelihood, and their ancient way of life could soon be lost. Miyamiji is a resident of Lamo who runs a restaurant business. 
Mia says the noise generated by motorcycle engines has driven away his customers. It was very lovely here. You can sit here and see the view, have your drinks and relax and peace. No problem. But since the motorbike has arrived now, you can't even walk around. For me, I cannot, I'm afraid to walk with my child on the street. I can't walk with my child on the street any minute because you don't know which side is for motorbike, which side is for people. The youth who depend on these motorbikes for a living are defending their trade. Well, the border, they are helping people, they are helping youth. It has created a lot of employment. All people, all youth who are under these robbery gangs that have entered the border, they have changed their life. It's true, but the borders have increased in number. But let's allow the youth to continue their work and earn a living. The impact of overfishing in Lamu has left fewer employment options for the island's youth. But the increasing presence of motorbikes here is feared could soon erode the cultural richness of this historical town. UNESCO declared Lamu Town a World Heritage Site in 2013. Daniel Arab Moy, CGTN, Lamu, Kenya. The greatest journeys, the greatest sights, the greatest adventures. Here in Panata, this weir allows the locals to walk on water. We're far more than just TV news. We're your passport to the wonders of Africa. To bring you stories of struggle, survival and hope. Ah. Ah. So let's explore. CGTN. See the difference. A South Africa entrepreneur is on a mission to provide millions of children in South Africa with shoes. Economic hardships mean many learners are left without basic necessities, including school shoes. The Barefoot Walk Challenge is an initiative run by Hope for Africa Foundation, which is trying to ensure children have what they need for school. It's estimated 7 million African children go to school barefoot or without proper shoes. Many pupils in South Africa have never had a pair of their own, but Barefoot Walk Africa is trying hard to change this reality. Every year for the last five years, Jabulani Tabeti has put his shoes away for 40 days to raise funds for school shoes for poor children in South Africa. There are kids who cry when they don't have school shoes, so others they get heartbroken, they're not focusing on school because they don't look the same. So we decided to sacrifice our 40 days without our shoes. Tabeti himself had faced the embarrassment of not having new school shoes. He vowed not to rest until every child can go to school with the appropriate footwear. When I was in Eastern Cape, the, the kids were walking bare feet there. So what I saw there, I cried for that day the whole night because I feel their pain. Now is winter season when they walk to school and what do you feel? They feel cold. Some other kids, they drop out at school. So we, sh we need to balance those kind of things. Close to 5,000 children have so far benefited from the program. These primary school children are the latest recipients. Most of the children, they don't have parents. They live with their grandparents, so the children don't have shoes, and the grandparents come to our school and ask for assistance, even with the food. They come to school and ask for the assistance. That's why we feel that we must find the donation to donate for this poorliness. If I see a child walking with abnormal school shoe, I have to take care of that child, because it, take, it takes a village to raise a child. So the initiative, it's promoting for us to, to, to say it takes a village to raise a child and it's promoting the co to give back to the community and love and integrity most of the times. The initiative is growing across Africa in Kenya, Botswana, Lesotho and Swaziland. In South Africa, Tibeti has roped in ambassadors, donors and friends to join the Barefoot Challenge. Julie Shara, CGTN, Johannesburg, South Africa. Coming up in sports. We tell you the story of a boxer in Togo who has set up a center for the social reintegration of children and unemployed youth.